Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. are back with another one of our reviews of a childhood favorite. I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. I'm Chris. And I'm Shane. And this week we're reviewing 1984's Streets of Fire with Michael Pere. Is that how we decided we're going to pronounce it? Yeah, (laughs) it's Pere. Pere, uh, Diane Lane, William Defoe, and Rick Moranis. But before we get into our stellar review, first a word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Fables. At Rock and Roll Fables, we bring you tall tales with a lot of style and very little substance. From leather motorcycles dashing through dreary nights to the neon flash of lip sync kidnappings, Rock and Roll Fables has you covered. So if you like shooting guns but can't win no medal, give Rock and Roll Fables a try. Rock and Roll Fables will take you to another time, another place. (laughs) <laughs> okay all right and bobby do you have random a... and meaningless <clears throat> just like this movie <laughs> all right bobby uh my brother in sickness uh do you have a summary for us i do streets of fire is a self-styled rock and roll fable set in a time and place reminiscent of grungy downtown detroit in the middle of the 1950s but featuring neon lights color televisions and 80s style music videos super vixen rocker and hometown kid done good ellen aim puts on a concert in front of a bunch of frenzied fans including gang leader raven shattuck and his bunch of thugs known as the bombers raven instantly falls in lust with our lovely millie vanilli wannabe chick So Raven and his bombers choose the perfect time to kidnap her, which happens to be as soon as the song ends. In the ensuing chaos, the bombers assault the backup band, kidnap Ellen, and throw her onto a motorcycle, while police cruisers inexplicably launch into parked cars, and women's tops tear off their bodies. Isn't that what's supposed to happen in Rock and Roll Fable? Somewhere in the world, the ubermensch Tom Cody receives an urgent telegram. Cody shows up that night on a train because obviously time doesn't exist in a rock and roll fable. Cody visits the diner where his sister hasn't seen him for years. While there, the leader of a gang of pussy roadmasters immediately challenges Cody to a butterfly knife opening contest. Cody wins and slaps the loser's face six times. He then bitch slaps the rest of the gang through plate glass windows and steals their stolen car. Ellen's colorblind and style-challenged business manager slash boyfriend, Billy Fish, hires Cody to kidnap back Ellen from the dastardly clutches of Raven and his bombers before Raven can remove his fireproof romper in front of the poor, tied-down Ellen. Everyone and their dog knows that Cody and Ellen were hot and heavy back in that day, but of course, Cody could care less about leaving super hot Diane Lane for, well, nothing actually. (laughs) <laughs> there's, there's obviously no sexual tension that sparks upon them meeting up again. Before setting out, Cody stumbles upon the butched out and totally badass ex-soldier McCoy at a bar. She isn't Cody's type, so we are assured of some witty sexual banter that won't go anywhere. But ultimately, if McCoy can handle Cody's gun, she can tag along. Under cover of night, Cody, McCoy, and Billy travel to the the battery in a stolen car full of guns. There, the bombers put on a display of fine iron horsemanship in their decked-out 50s-style Harleys. While inside Torchy's bar, Jennifer Beals' flashdance body double treats us to a strip tease on the bar. While all eyes are watching the topless dancer's well-choreographed feet, McCoy slips in and holds Raven and a room full of his badass biker gangsters at bay with a single revolver. Meanwhile, outside, Cody shoots holes in the bomber's bikes so many times you'd think you saw the same one explode three or four different times in the same sequence. Cody breaks into Torchies, rescues Ellen, and then somehow in all the chaos, hooks up with McCoy. With Ellen in tow, they all run out of the place, guns ablaze. They then speed off down the middle of a one-way alley in their bright red stolen convertible, while heavily armed bombers surround them and threaten their lives. No word yet on if if our body double babe flash danced her tight tail out of there. 
Our heroes dr- drive into the darkness only to ditch the cherry red hot rod. They stop a broken down bus full of unemployed black doo wop singers named the Shirelles. While treating everyone to their lip syncing wondery, our hapless clan runs into the most inept police ro- roadblock since the Keystone Cops. So while Cody blows holes in their Studebakers, McCoy drives the bus through the flaming carnage to freedom. Once back in downtown Detroit, even a torrential downpour can't put out the white hot flame the burn that burns between Cody and Ellen. So the two swap spit in a cozy bed while Billy impatiently waits outside with Cody's ten thousand dollars for services rendered. Which service is left to your imagination? Once all their midnight oil burns out, our heroes realize they are in over their heads. Since you can't call the Ghostbusters in this fable, they enlist the top of the help of two Count them, two Detroit cops. To sum up, that's two Detroit cops, one ridiculously sexy Cody, and a strange brew brother against Raven and a hundred of his bombers packing Winchesters on motorcycles. I think they forgot the odds. Thankfully for our heroes, this is a rock and roll fable. So instead of torching Detroit and causing all kinds of hell because their own bar is in ruins, the bombers choose the more intelligent and genteel path. They decide to send their 5-foot and 8-inch leader, Raven, to face off mano a mano against the 6-foot-2 stud muffin with a lot of love and Cody in a sledgehammer battle to the death. Universal Pictures might have sold you the seat, but you're only going to need the edge. <laughs> Does Cody overcome Raven in the duel of pickaxes? Will Cody and Ellen use this opportunity to seal their love forever by sharing more bodily fluids in the back of the red convertible in public so it can humiliate Billy Fish even more? Will McCoy ever realize she's a lesbian and go for Cody's sister? Will we get to see not one, but two more MTV-worthy lip-sync performances before we get to the true finale of this movie? This is a rock and roll fable, so you'll have to see it to believe it. The end. (laughs) All right. Streets of Fire, released on June 1st, 1984, the same day as Once Upon a Time in America and Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, uh, the same month as Gremlins, Ghostbusters, The Karate Kid, Cannonball Run 2, Bachelor Party, Top Secret, and Bobby's all-time favorite film, Rhinestone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really good. I saw that in the theater, believe it or not, sadly. All right. Made on a budget of $14.5 million, it grossed over $8 million at the box office. It was the 90th highest grossing film of 1984, right behind, behind such classic films as 1984, Reckless, and The Philadelphia Experiment. And right in front of such films as Just the Way You Are, The Little Drummer Girl, and Ninja 3, The Domination. It was nominated for an award, uh, a Razzie Award for Best Supporting Actress, uh, Diane Lane, uh, for, really? the fi- for, the, for this film and her role in Cotton Club. However, she lost to Lynn Holly Johnson for Where the Boys Are. Uh, it was planned for a trilogy that never actually panned out. Uh, the other films were supposed to be called The Far City and Cody's Return. Uh, however, an unofficial sequel was made in 2008 with Michael Pere and Deborah Van Velkenberg again playing his sister. Rotten Tomatoes, Shane's favorite uh, rating, has it at 67% critics and 70% audience. So that is the numbers on Streets of Fire. All right. I don't know who to go to first, Shane or Bobby. Both of you guys really wanted to review this film. So who wants to start? Uh, Okay. Well, this has always been one of my favorite movies, and it's one of my go-to movies when I'm having a few beers and I just want to put something on and enjoy it. And the opening scenes, like up until – the credits and that big fight in the diner, I have watched over and over and over again. Just just amazing. From the song from Ellen Aim and the Attackers through to just after the big fight in the diner. I just used to watch on loop. I just used to love those credit scenes and the music and everything. But I just briefly I will have to say that time hasn't served this movie very well. Um, mm-hmm. I still really enjoy it, but I don't think time served it well. Oh, I'm actually quite along the same lines as what Shane said. I actually saw this in the theater when it first came out, and I fell in love with it in the theater uh, in 1984. So this was a perfect uh, teenage or, you know, upper teens, early 20s. I I think I was 19 when this came out. And uh, this was the perfect time to watch that movie. And it was just a, a macho guy movie with a lot of really cool, you know, foot tapping songs and uh that that were inserted throughout the entire movie so this movie is i agree 100 percent with shane in that this is a go-to for me 
you know, we talk about top 100 movies and, you know, all the classics, Casablanca, Citizen Kane, The Godfather, and so on. And this is actually my top 100 just because I love to watch it. It's a terrible movie for, you know, <laughs> <laughs> technically and you know and spiritually and so on but it, it hits me just right and i've i honestly have watched this movie i kid you not 30 to 40 times easy it, it's just I, I i love it um i actually upgraded just recently to the blu-ray version of it the shout factory blu-ray which we'll talk about later but uh i and i'm so thankful that i did that i learned even more about the movie so yeah this is this is a great movie and this is one of those movies for a rainy day to me because it's got rain throughout so it just kind of touches it's great chris did you see this in the 80s I did not see it in the 80s, and actually I had never even heard of it until um, Bobby mentioned it to me about a year ago. Yeah. So I knew nothing about this film. And I think that if I would have seen it in 1984 as a kid, I would have absolutely loved it. I mean, it's got a great visual look to it. Um, as a kid, I didn't notice story as much, so it wouldn't have bothered me that the story is a little lacking and does is nonsensical at times. But, you know, it's... I don't think that was the point of this film. I think it was to make it look great, have a certain feel. It's almost like a slightly comedic Blade Runner in many ways with uh, with some pretty good music. So while um, I wasn't really enamored as an adult with it, I think that I, I completely understand why this is a cult film and why so many people enjoy this film. I think Bobby said it best. It, this would be a perfect rainy day film to watch. Well, I actually did see it in the 80s. I, I very easily remember the soundtrack. I had it on tape. I, I did not have the soundtrack until uh, we watched this. I watched this movie again, and then I downloaded it off iTunes. Uh, I remember the songs really well because I remember listening to the soundtrack, but it was the music that attracted me to this film, um, part of that MTV generation, and they uh, a couple of the songs were had music videos. I, I remember seeing the film. I don't remember a damn thing about this film other, other than I know I saw it, uh, but it was, it, it did not make an impact on me. I remember Rick Moranis being in it because this is also the same year Ghostbusters. It's the same month that Ghostbusters comes out. And I, I know him from Strange Brew and from this. So he was definitely a, 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 you know, had an appeal to me. I remember Diane Lane from Six Pack. So, uh, you know, there was some of the actors I knew, but most of them, and, and this is a, a really good ensemble cast. You have a lot of up and coming actors and, you know, Bill Paxton and, uh, Rick, I want to say Rosenvich or, I mean, can't remember. Rosevich. 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 Yeah. They, I mean, <clears throat> you're seeing, they have brief little parts, but, uh, they, in, you know, later in the eighties, they have more substantial parts in bigger films. So it was, uh, you, you definitely, the casting director was, uh, a list in this cause he definitely, he or she definitely got some outstanding people in, in this film. But, uh, this film was not a treasure gem for me other than the sound. I had the soundtrack until I upgraded stuff to CDs. And I don't think I, in the nineties, I was able to find the CD. So, uh, the, the tape disappeared into history and now I have it again on my iTunes. So I have the music again, but uh, you know, I always think of this as a musical, but it's not really a musical or would you guys define it as what one? This is one that actually I, I wouldn't consider a musical because it's, it's based around concert footage or, or uh, concert uh, performances, but not necessarily as part of the storyline. They're just, you know, it, they're, Ellen sings a lot. The Shirelles sing a lot, but it's part they they go along with the with where they're going at the time. So I think it's more of a plot device than anything. It's not necessarily a musical to me. However, the music, which we, I I'm sure we'll talk about later, especially with Shane, <laughs> but uh, that that soundtrack is something that we we definitely need to talk about because it's it's ingrained in the story. It's a rock and roll fable for a reason. I just want to also bring up, um, just to add on to what you said before, Patrick, about up-and-coming stars. Elizabeth Daly is in this, who I totally forgot that she was in. And also uh, Richard Lawson, who is in Poltergeist, which is another one of my favourite films of all time. Uh, the, the, I have the soundtrack as well. However, I've got a vinyl copy, uh, an old <laughs> original vinyl copy, which I uh, really uh, cherish. And... I wouldn't call it a musical either. Like Bobby said, it's 
it's a story built around music, but the songs that are on the soundtrack, every single one of them has purpose and is yeah. is good in some way. Some are better than others, but they are good. Yeah, yeah I don't consider it a musical either. I think the music scenes kind of bookend the story, and uh, they just have a lot of uh, good music uh, as the background throughout. But no, I don't really consider it one either. All right. Well, we've we kind of talked about um, the cast, uh, and I, I, I put it as a note: like this is an outstanding cast. Does anybody stand out in particular that is head and shoulders above everyone else? Well, for obvious reasons, Diane Lane. <laughs> she's uh, she was only just eighteen or something apparently when she filmed right. this, and she's just amazing and reminded me a little bit of say Jennifer Lawrence when she was starting out in films, Jennifer Lawrence was a, a, and there's been many others, but I'm just using Jennifer as an example, as an actress who can act beyond her years and be really believable in a, in an older style role. And there was nothing teenage about Diane Lane in this. She, even though she lip synced, she did a pretty good version of the lip syncing as far as I'm concerned. And if anyone has to stand out, I would probably go with Michael Paré. He, he, he's just your, He's cliched. He's a cliched hero, but he's perfect. And he just has to stand there and it works. The way he's dressed, the way he looks, the way he talks, his attitude. So I would say Michael Paré, if I had to pick one person to stand out. But Diane Lane, for other reasons, is spectacular. Well, I do think he's uh, he's pretty good. Um, Rick Moranis stands out because I think of him more as comedic roles and he's pretty much a dick in uh-huh. this film and at times it seems like he's struggling to even spit out some of those lines i know yeah. it's very early in his career he only had strange brew uh in on his film resume before this but uh his was a little bit awkward at times i thought but i think the real standout in this is amy madigan as mccoy i wish i could have I, I would just watch a whole film with her i mean <laughs> she was great in this yeah i will agree with i like diane lane I, I don't think of my sorry Shane, but I don't think of Michael Pere as the outstanding. I think that's part of the acting low in this film. <laughs> <laughs> so. Really, I, would have, I, would have said, I, I just would have said Billy Fish, Rick Moranis. He's he's acting is so bad, and he's struggling to even bother to be there. You can well, tell. He's definitely playing against type, and I don't believe him in that character, but I'm also not supposed to like that character. So, you know, it's very, I I think he accomplishes what he's supposed to do. He's an unlikable character, and I I did not like him. Michael Prey is supposed to be a character that I do like, and I don't really care for him that much. I liked, I I wanted more of Diane Lane because I know her ability as an actress, and she doesn't have that much to do. I mean, she looks great, she looks amazing, but she doesn't say much through most of the film. I like it. Madigan in it. William Defoe is scenery chewing throughout this entire film. It's just like, oh, it's and I and I really like William Defoe. But uh, you know, my wife is a huge William Defoe fan for some reason, and she walked in the middle of me watching this when he's wearing his, you know, <laughs> nipple jumper. high uh, <laughs> leather jumper, and she's like, "What in the hell is he? What <laughs> what is he wearing? And what are you watching? You know, this is." <laughs> I like I don't know. It's called Streets of Fire. I you know if, if you yeah. <laughs> it, let me let me chime in too because my feeling I I'm with Chris on the fact that I think Amy Madigan was was the standout of the bunch because when I I saw this in the theater I fell in love with Amy Madigan. I actually had a little bit of a crush on her if you can believe that. She just came across as just this really cool chick that you just I mean she was she was his buddy. I mean, she was a, a, a true sidekick and uh, I just got a lot of, I got a lot of kick out of her. And I have to say with the rest of the cast, I mean, I love Di- Diane Lane. I think I agree. I think she was underused. I wish she could have been in a little more, but this was a macho movie and there were so many stilted roles with people that aren't necessarily the tough guy and they were playing up to that. And I think that that was probably what made it slightly awkward for some of, you know, the Rick Moranis and the Willem Dafoe's and, and Bill Paxton. I mean, they're not normally those tough guy actors that, and, and they're, they are, you know, quoting lines rather than actually naturally speaking because if rick moranis was to spit out billy fish's lines it would have come out 
funny and we probably would have sympathized with him a little more but patrick's right she's or i'm sorry he's he's kind of you know, he's supposed to be the dick nobody's you know we don't want diane to end up with him in the end but he does you know so it's just that's the way it goes but Michael Pere is, I think he was exactly what they needed. Um, this was only his second movie, so I think he stepped into the role. He had to learn on the fly so many of the things that he had to do in the role. He did not know how to ride a, ride a motorcycle until the day before he had to ride a motorcycle on set. So he went out with the stunt coordinator and had him just learn how to ride a motorcycle the night before just to look cool the butterfly knife thing he's a he was a chef before he was in the movies and so they just handed him a knife and said can you do this and he did it he was instantly knew how to do a butterfly knife so you know he could do stuff and he was willing to he was you know high wiring on those pipes in cowboy boots you know without straps i mean he was sitting up there in very dangerous locations and they said basically okay get from point a to point b go and he was like okay go and they were like afterwards the stunt coordinator's like what did you do that for he's like well they told me to and he said you're not supposed to do that you're supposed to be cabled up you're you know i mean they did so many crazy things based on what the director wanted or what the writer wanted, not necessarily what each of the actors could, were capable of. He'd done Eddie and the Cruises, I right? Think, before that was this. his first. That was his first, and he was cast for that reason. Yep. Right. Well, that's also considered a musical, but yeah. I don't know that is either. Um, he did come to Australia um, in the early '80s and made a movie called Undercover as well, and I think that would have been released around the same year as Streets of Fire, maybe the year after. So. Um, that, I found that interesting early in his career. He actually was over, overseas down under filming a movie, which well, wasn't did, a hit, by the way. He did Philadelphia Experiment that, that literally finished one to, or 94, 95 compared to this, right? They were like back-to-back, -back, Patrick? Yeah. On your numbers? And he was the star of Eddie and the Cruisers, you know, Streets of Fire and Philadelphia Experiment, literally on top of one another. And nobody had known who this guy was. Yeah, and undercover because he would have yeah. been in Australia at some point. Well, one thing that I think this film is successful at, it has a visual style to it. I mean, very, very distinctive style. And uh, the cinematography and the sets are amazing throughout. And if that's where they spent it, uh, a lot of their money, they spent it very, very well. They did, yeah. So that uh, using the locations that they did and uh, creating the visuals I mean, it, it, you talked about how um, this is very similar to a Blade Runner. I didn't see that so much as a Blade Runner, but I saw it more as along the lines of something like The Warriors, which obviously is another Wolf yeah. film. You know, it, it, it kind of seems like this film out of place in time. You know, that there's these elements of modern day, but there's these elements of the past. And, and you can't really put it in any kind of time frame and uh, what did you guys think of the visual style and uh, the look of the film oh that was the best thing of this uh i i really enjoyed the look of it even on the the um kind of crappy dvd version that i had i still thought it looked amazing and i think it holds up uh quite well i mean the the theme you know the year eric the year it came out was 1984 so there's very an or um orson wells there's a very um 1984 ish type orwellian feel to this and uh i don't know what the reasoning was for throwing in the 50s style i don't know if they're going for some sort of dystopian west side story or not but uh i think they pulled it off very well and i think it looks great no it holds up quite well yeah, actually, Chris touched on it, and I think that we should probably talk talk about the fact that the there's a difference in quality between the VHS, the DVD, and the the new Shout Factory Blu-ray that came out a couple years ago, because there's a distinct difference. Because there's a very red look to the VHS and the DVD that is not. It's been completely cleaned out on the on the Shout Factory. The Shout Factory is like watching a brand new movie. 
its fantastic version. So whatever Chris was seeing with some of that washed out, it's it's because of the of the transfer, not because of the movie itself. Because the movie's fantastic looking, and they have a two hour behind the scenes that I watched on the Blu-ray that talks about every facet of this whole thing, including the set the set decoration. They took over Universal Studios, basically the back lot, and put a tarp over the whole thing, rebuilt the entire set, and they were shooting. Uh, shooting shotguns to clear out the birds every day. They had a windstorm that literally almost tore the tarp off because they they wanted to shoot at night most of the time, and they had to do that by covering it with this giant tarp that was a danger to all of the the teamsters that were up there trying to keep it down uh, in windstorms. So yeah, the the look of this thing is is second to none. You just don't find movies that are that are set apart like this. The dystopian look of it, I think, is definitely uh, on purpose by both the director and the production uh, designer and I think that this movie is uh, you're not going to find many that look like this uh, and and it's that feel I think that's what makes this movie kind of special is the fact that you're never going to see another one like it it's like Blade Runner you know Blade Runner is has been copied a bunch but it, it doesn't it, it you're never going to find Blade Runner again it just is it, it was its own world and this is kind of the same way so I really appreciate that about it I w- was unfortunately never saw it at the cinema. Uh, it did get a Japanese cinema remastered re-release earlier this year that I heard about, and I was so keen to actually just fly over to Japan and see it, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, I have it on, and I don't know why I don't have that Blu-ray that Bobby's talking about yet. Uh, it's honestly, expensive. I, well, you know, that this kind of movie I, I would pay top dollar for, I wouldn't care. Um, <laughs> I just, just wouldn't, you know, to get to get a copy, but I have yet to do that. So I still just use, I just put on my uh, DVD, which is full screen too. So I can imagine that the Blu-ray is probably widescreen um, as well. But the cinematography in this is, is second to none. I mean, you can see where the money went. But you know what bugged me watching it again, and it's been a while since I've actually actually watched it from beginning to end, is uh, the clothes, the cars, and the props, and the sets, 80s or 50s. You know, it was <laughs> – the combination didn't really work for me sometimes. But as a cinematic film to look at, you're right, um, I would, I'll be really interested to see it in uh, a restored version because my DVD has, you know – been around for a while well gentlemen i have it on voodoo which i purchased for 4.99 plus tax and, <laughs> uh, and it did not have uh it, that was on sale for it was a weekly sale so it just happened to come before when we decided to review it it hit the sale and i went oh i'm picking that up uh, i do not get any extra so i i have that disadvantage but it was a pretty clean copy I, I there was no kind of tint to it at all it was it was and it was widescreen so that might be where you might be able to pick it up at too on on the cheap, but it was a it was an, uh, a nice purchase and a convenient purchase for me at least at that time. All right, musical or not, uh, this film is full of music and Shane's on the podcast, so we have to discuss the music. Uh, what did you guys? Uh, we've kind of talked about it already, but what did you guys think of the music and which was your favorite song in the film? Well, uh, it's kind of funny. I, I told Bobby this, uh, I think yesterday that I didn't realize the song I can dream about you mm-hmm. came from this film. I just thought it was an MTV music video. So I never knew it was part of a film. And that actually is my favorite, uh, of this film, probably because that one's most familiar and has the most nostalgia to me. The others were great, but, uh, that's the one that always stands out in my mind. They're all good in their own way, and uh, I like Sorcerer. I think Sorcerer is a really good ballad. Um, not a lot of people talk about that one. It's mostly One Bad Star, I Can Dream About You, and the two that bookend it from Fire Inc. I think I will go for I Can uh, Tonight at What It Means Is To Be Young, which is yep. the, the mm-hmm. final song. And that was one of the singles. That was one of the music videos I remember seeing in the 80s. Well, Jim Steinman had an album out before this was made, and there was a very similar song on that album that they actually reworked for this song. Yeah, so I know Jim Steinman 
is credited as the writer and producer, but I can't think offhand what album it was from or the name of the song, but it wasn't tonight what it means to be young. And it was it was the same tune, had a lot of the same lyrics in it, but they actually sort of twisted it around for the movie version um, for any of the purists that want to go out and check that out by Jim Steinman. And I had a VHS tape that was a promotional release, and when I was working at the video shop, it had three songs and then an eight-minute making of at the end of the tape. So it ran for about 25, 30 minutes, and I just used to play it on a loop all the time on the TV screens in the video shop. <laughs> so it had the two main Fire Inc. songs as well as I Can Dream About You and then the little making of. And people used to ask all the time, oh, what's this movie? Because I don't think it was that well promoted and because it didn't, no. didn't do well in Australian cinemas either. But I know it was released. I didn't get to see it there, but it, I think it was popular on VHS and then DVD and it's found its audience, obviously. Well, I, I agree with what Chris was saying about the I Can Dream About You, but what I noticed was um, I bought a bunch of old oh. 80s videos the old mtv videos and i didn't realize that i can dream about you came out with two separate mtv videos one was by dan hartman himself where he had the shirelles singing the movie uh, on he they were in a diner and they were singing or they had the shirelles on a tv but dan hartman was actually doing the singing so that was really unique to see that where they were they were pitching streets of fire on television during the the video and then of course the shirelles doing their version had their own mtv video um the two fire ink songs to me are the standouts as far as i'm concerned i mean there's there's all kinds of stuff in here i mean what is it the bombers what that the bombers sing who's who's hold that what is it? hold that snake or something uh, they've they've got some really cool songs right in the middle where they're in the battery where the girl's dancing that was some really rocking stuff too it was pretty cool but, torchies torchies yeah exactly but um the i i have to agree that my favorite song hands down is tonight is what it means to be young uh, it's the last one and that's for personal reasons because i mean there's parts of my own life that i've actually applied to the soundtrack and i i actually have the two fire ink songs on my daily pod or play cap playlist that i at work i listen to them over and over every single day so <laughs> this is a lifestyle for me the streets of fire soundtrack so i really really love this and and i think that i i I think if anybody actually went out and found the soundtrack like you did, Patrick, I mean, you went out and found the thing. And I think if you listen to this just once, you'd go, hey, that's Bonnie Tyler singing for Fire Inc. And my son even came in while I was watching Streets of Fire and he goes, hey, that's Bonnie Tyler. I went, no, it's not. It's Fire Inc. And it's not her. <laughs> um, so we actually had an argument. And he's like, no, that's the song, you know, holding out for a hero. And so I was like, that's a completely different movie. You know, not that's Footloose. This is not the same movie. And uh, but I mean, you got into a little argument over it and it was really fun. So, yeah, this is this is a soundtrack. I think everybody from the 80s should own. Um, I know friends of mine that actually own like like Shane was saying they have the vinyl of this and still listen to it on occasion so I thought that was pretty cool yeah excellent excellent soundtrack All right one question was Robert Townsend the weak link in the Sorrells <laughs> I think he's too goofy to be a backup singer yeah he should have been in the five heartbeats well, was apparently both? those those four in never acted together so they'd met each other for the first time and it took them four weeks to learn all that chore choreography on the dancing scenes <laughs> you know um, <coughs> well stormy did a real good job was his name stormy stony stony jackson stony yeah yeah he did real good on the mon on the moonwalk that was pretty slick well you taught me something i didn't realize that um it was the flash dance dance double that was mm -hmm. at torchies mm -hmm. because I always was led to believe there must have been more than one flash dance Jennifer Beals dance double because I was led to believe that one of them was a, a male that was dancing for her in that final scene in flash dance, like it was a male dancer just with a wig on. But uh, uh, Jennifer Beals, if you're listening, uh, he does not represent the opinion of everyone <laughs> in Lunchtime Movie Review that you look like a man. No, I didn't say that. I did not say that. Or the dance that. double does not look like a man. <laughs> no. No, no. No. Or I, I was just led to believe one of the dance doubles in flash dance was actually a male, but <laughs> all these years I might have must have been wrong. I think you're confusing that with staying alive. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Well, I, I will go along with Chris is that the song that brought me to this film was I Can Dream About You by Dan Hartman. Um, however, I've, I'd always, I've always thought it was very entertaining is that how you must feel that, hey, your, your, your song's a top 10 hit and no one knows you sang it. <laughs> Yes, because and that a, you're white. Yeah, yeah, and that you're white. Because the music video came out from the film, and everybody thinks uh, that uh, you're part of that band. And and no, no, I I, I really sang it, guys. I really sang <laughs> it. No, no, you're not. You're not Dan Hartman. I saw the movie. You're not in it. So. <laughs> But that's why they made the movie for, or the video for MTV was he's singing it with Stoney Jackson singing it right behind him on television. It's actually a really cute video. If you, it's on YouTube. You I, can pull it up. It's I, pretty cool. I, I, I remember seeing it once, maybe twice back in the 80s. But the video that they played to death was the film yeah. version of yeah. it. So that was uh, – yeah, forever he'll be forever scorned. The, this isn't Dan Hartman. This is not who I came to see. <laughs> Yeah, that was the one that I remember just seeing all, all the time on T- MTV. All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Uh, we haven't mentioned Ed Begley Jr. as another <laughs> actor who, pop, who pops up. Was he that funny? No. <laughs> I was just um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So I, I know we haven't brought him up yet. Um, very small role, but yeah. You guys spotted him too, I guess. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's blatantly out there, much like. Uh, Bill Paxton, you know, you can't miss yeah. him. He's very identifiable. But I kept thinking that he's going to come back in some capacity in the film. I'm like, oh, I, I guess that was it. And because wasn't right. he insane elsewhere by this point in time? That wasn't he at least. Uh, I, uh, I, some, I never watched that. No. Amazon Women on the Moon was around this time, too. Yeah. I think Amazon Women was 85, 86. Okay. And I also want to mention that Daryl Hannah was actually really, really close to getting the Diane Lane role. She auditioned. Oh. She, she was almost written into the part and, and accepted it, but then she took Splash. And uh, Diane Lane hadn't had The Outsiders or Rumblefish out yet, so they still hired her, even though those two movies, which were filmed back-to-back, hadn't come out yet. But, yeah, Daryl Hannah went on and did Splash, which was a huge hit that year, and uh, – this one wasn't. Well, thank God that happened because that would have made this film even that much worse. <laughs> that's, she that's already facts. had a dystopian movie out anyway. <laughs> well, uh, I I think that if you ever get a chance to watch, if you do like the movie, anybody that's listening, I highly, highly recommend trying to locate the Blu-ray with the behind the scenes because the stories they act, they interview Michael Perret and Amy Madigan and, and it was like 2014 2015 whenever they made the Blu-ray was when they interviewed the, the stars and they're extremely candid along with the director uh, Walter Hill so they're they're really candid about what happened and uh, what they were thinking during the set Michael Perret was married at the time and he said you know he's like 10 years older than Diane in real life and he said I, I fell in love with Diane Lane. She was that outstanding of an actress and, and as a person. So, you know, they had a real a real dynamic going on between the two of them. And Amy was just hilarious. So it's really fun to listen to them. But uh, um, I, I, I just was saying that it's worth the two hour listen um, or, or watching of that if, if you love this movie. If nothing else, to hear the stories of how um, oh. Michael Perret hated Rick Moranis. <laughs> yes. Oh, they did. Well, and, and you know why? Do, do you know why they didn't like each other? Because Rick Moranis was picking on him the whole time and being sorry. Because he's, he's a comedian, and, and he's really fast, and Michael Perret was an actor. You know, so Moranis has got – he can come up with all kinds of funny lines, and, and he, was, he was a bully to Michael Perret on set. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Little, I, little Rick Moranis. Uh, who would have thought it, too? Mm-hmm. Well, they, they hate each other's characters. <laughs> Do they interview the um, costume person? Yeah. They, they, I don't remember who. They had several, several people on there that, that, that were part of the entire production. I mean, they left no stone unturned other than interviews with some of the stars because they talked to everybody else uh the, the stunt coordinator the assistant stunt coordinator the production designer they had all their drawings i mean they had pictures of the set as it's being made of the wind blowing the set i mean it was crazy the <laughs> detail the detail on this it, shane you've got to find it if you love this movie so much oh, that, I, that's I'm, 
it's worth Shocked it. I haven't got it already. Yeah, find that one. But Marilyn Vance, who, um, yeah, I'll just hope that she was getting, she got interviewed and asked about the hundred uh, percent pleather Willem Dafoe outfit. <laughs> I'd like to know the background of that. They they do talk about uh, about um, costumes for sure, so I know that that's that's part of it. <laughs> And I'd like to say Walter Hill, the director. He, oh, he's funny. he's had a funny career, you know, like hot and cold. And this would have been a pretty big flop for him in the day because he was known to have quite big hits be- before and after this. He took over Universal Studios. The entire backlot was his. Yeah. That's gigantic in the day. You you just don't do that today for for directors unless you're a, a Steven Spielberg. So yeah, he he really he owned Universal Studios at the time. And what a flop. Well, and and you think of uh you know the films he was making around the time he had The Warriors um and he had 48 Hours just shortly before this, which is what why this film even gets made is because uh he is a hot property at the time uh and was that, I wanted to the, and, and the bar in 48 Hours is also called Torchies, True. when Eddie Murphy goes in. Right. right. Yep. In several of his movies, actually, that is the that is the bar. He just oh, uses yeah. the name over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they talk about the set designer had to create a different look for toward the, the Streets of Fire Torchies. They didn't want it to look exactly like 48 Hours, that, so he had to come up with new neon for it. So he, cool. created, he created all the sets uh, based around – and they love the neon. They talk very detailed about all the neon that's in the movie. How how they wanted a specific look, like the opening credits when it says a rock and you know Streets of Fire, a rock and roll fable, as they're yeah. walking up to Ellen Aim in the in the raindrops. They said that was an a uh, happy accident with all that neon there. Uh, it, they, it they weren't expecting it until they got to the dailies and went, wow, we got this great opening shot. <laughs> so it's very cool stuff. Happy accidents in the film business, but yeah, I mean he had a you know in the eighties it. You know, he had uh, the Long Riders early '80s. He had the Warriors at the end of the '70s, 48 Hours, um, and which are all good movies. No, and they're all decent films. And you know, and he also was a producer on Alien and Aliens. Um, so, I mean, he was a hot property at the time. And unfortunately, I think right after, well, starting with Streets of Fire, I'm looking at Brewster's Millions, not so good. Crossroads, not so good. Extreme Prejudice, Red Heat was a mild hit. Not a great one, but a mild hit. And Johnny Handsome is another stylistically visual, visually interesting film, but not really good. <laughs> I like it. I think it's underrated. Johnny Handsome, Morgan Freeman, and Mickey Rourke, Ellen Barkin. It was a good film. Yeah, great cast. I mean, yeah. So. Uh, and I mean, he also tried to take his name off a movie called Supernova when that got released. I always remember that, a James Spader, Angela Bassett film. Um, he hated it, and it got changed on him. So I think over time, uh, studios, he had control of Universal during this film, but over time he got less and less control. And he actually doesn't – he would be still getting royalties because he helped actually write – he script-doctored a lot of Alien – um, and aliens, as well as produced, obviously his name's there. But you'll see his name on every Alien movie, even Alien versus Predator, those those films, because he er- helped originate it. So he's just getting royalties for the rest of his career from whatever Alien movie comes out. And you would think if he tried to get his name off Supernova, he would try to get his name off Alien versus Predator. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Well, that was a few <laughs> years later. But Supernova, I actually saw in the theatre and Lou Diamond Phillips. And yeah, it was a pretty uh, ordinary film, so I'm not surprised. Anything else, guys? <laughs> the, the ending? The yeah, uh, the sure. showdown, I should say. Not the, the ending was the songs, but the showdown between Willem Dafoe and Michael Perret. What did you guys think of that? The choice of weapon as well as the <laughs> – I mean – it was literally you've got a hundred bombers and you've got townspeople with two cops and they walk out there and go, okay, let's just put leader against leader. Let's throw out some sledgehammers and let's go for it. Winner take all. What'd you guys think of that? Sure. In this rock and roll fantasy, why not? I mean, <laughs> it's about the only reason like, no, they would take over the, the, they would take over the little town, you know, the bombers and, you know, impose their wills, what the realistic yeah. world, uh, world circumstance would be. But I mean, it's pretty tame, really. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't call it a realistic fight. I don't think anyway. It was all right. 
it, it, it just went with the uh, silly goofiness of the the underlying goofiness of this film and the nonsensical nature of this story at times. I mean, visually them uh, uh, slugging it out with sledgehammers looked pretty cool, um, which is pretty much all they were going for was, you know, the visual look. But I didn't mind it. Um, I was all, I was surprised when, uh, uh, I guess you could say, Willem Dafoe's number two. We just picked him up and uh, everybody went home. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, like Patrick, was like, now nah, they're – and if this was a real gang fight, they would have it. They would have just brawled. It yeah, would have been, uh, yeah. It, it would have been um, like a blazing saddles sort of ending, where it's just a one big melee. Yeah. But uh, no, it, it it fit fine. I I was laughing even before I saw Patrick's outline about the Casablanca ending. I'm like, uh, this looks very familiar to me. Where uh, he just <laughs> walks away. Well, the. Uh... Uh, on the behind the scenes, they talk about those were real hammers that they were using, and they did miss a couple times. <laughs> and and uh, Michael Pere remembers he got hit once by one of them, and he said it, it it was it was a real blow. So they really choreographed the thing to death, and they used the real weight and the real the real things. So if they missed, it was a bad thing. So you know, I I thought that the realism was good on that, but yeah, it just that was the only realistic part about it. You know. All I keep hearing is that how dangerous this was for Michael Pere to make this film. That it was. He, and he, you got to listen to the behind the scenes because he's laughing the whole time. He's like, "I was a stupid kid. I trusted all these people, these professionals." He says, "You know, when he was out there with uh, when he had to blow up the the police cars." Yeah. Um, he said he says he's sitting out there and he's got his shotgun and he's ready to to start firing, and he turns around and he looks and the entire crew is behind these glass. You know, pl- these. Uh, protective glass things and he's standing out in the middle of this this thing and they're like he's like what's going on and they're like well we want to make sure we don't get any glass <laughs> you know when when this explodes it's gonna you know it's literally gonna throw glass everywhere and michael Perry's like um i'm standing here you know pulling the trigger and and they were just and they were like yeah just do your best yeah. and he says sure enough they were pulling glass out of his face i mean it's crazy well, he's a big guy. He looks looked fit and agile. So you know, I I thought he'd probably had if something did go wrong, he'd have a pretty quick reaction to it. Yeah, but when you're up on a you know a six a six story building in boots running across a a little pi- a little pipe somewhere. It's a long ways down onto concrete, and they never strapped him in, nothing. He just did it. They said, go here, go to there, go. <laughs> and, okay, and he ran, you know, in the rain. And it was like – and he laughs about it now, obviously, as you know, a 55-year-old guy, and he's just like, I can't believe how stupid I was. But it was funny listening to him because they got such a kick out of the making of this movie more so than they even got out of the, out of the, the end product. It was cool. All right. Well, wrapping it up, uh, do we think the film stands the test of time? We'll start with Chris. Um, I don't know what to make of it as standing the test of time since I didn't see it as a as a kid. I think that the the print that I saw it definitely looks a little bit dated. Um, however, I see the uh, immense appeal and of this film, even though the story is kind of lacking. And there's a lot of goofiness, I think, put it all together and it works in a very odd way. And I, I completely understand why people enjoy this film so much. Although I don't think there's enough of a story for me, I'm going to go ahead and say this does stand the test of time. Bobby? Uh, I agree with 100 percent with what Chris said about today's view of this movie. If somebody that has never seen this movie or uh, somebody that's not of this generation that would have that would have been around the 80s and seen the styles and and so on. I think this movie would be something that is nostalgic in a negative way. But for those that are of this generation that would have seen this movie um, in the 80s or the 90s uh, on video, and uh, ultimately now that they've got the new Blu-ray out, this movie to me is a must must watch just because of the soundtrack alone um the fact that you just don't see movies that are this macho it to me this is such a fun fun movie you literally just plug it in and watch it go it, turn up your speakers and let the thing just rock you through the whole thing my son who he likes a lot of the movies that i put on 
that just come out of the woodwork. I'm just like, oh, you got to try this one. Oh, you got to try this one. I threw on Streets of Fire, and he was just like, this is a cool movie. And I'm going, you know, this is a teenage kid, you know, that's watching this stupid 1984 dumb, you know, no no storyline like Chris said. There's no hardly any story. It's just macho, 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 you know, guys firing at each other and getting in fist fights and, you know, over just nothing. And he loved it, and I'm going. That's that's exactly what a movie is supposed to be. This is a truly entertaining movie. Even today, it's worth the entertainment value. So yeah, I I, I this is not a, a movie from the from the you know 2010 era. It, it wouldn't be, wouldn't stand up against those. But as a something to watch that you just enjoy, yeah, I would say this would stand the test of time easily. Shane, yeah, I'll oh, the that to Chris and Bobby's thoughts. But I'll also add, out of, ha- out of all the amount of times that I've watched it before, watching again last night for this podcast, I had more issues with it than I ever had. And I don't know why. I, you know, I, I just I can't get my head around the 80s and 50s um, combining. I, I don't know if that necessarily works. The Damsel in Distress does work. I, I think Diane Lane isn't in the film enough, but she's very good, and I like Michael Poiré. So does it stand the test of time? I would say yes, probably it does cinematically, and if you're watching it for the first time, turn it up. Mm. The songs alone are the best. For me, the, right. the, the, the songs, the soundtrack, trump the cinematography and the cinematography is still pretty bloody good yep all right well i saw this in the 80s made no impact on me whatsoever <laughs> a very uneventful film however i did have the soundtrack so the music did so i'll agree with shane in that regard the music made an impact on me that i really enjoyed the soundtrack i hadn't had it for a couple of decades so it was very nice to find out that it was available on itunes for me to download and get those songs that i haven't or listen to in a long time the acting is not a strong point of this film it is not and the storyline is pretty straightforward uh boyfriend goes saves girlfriend and t- gets her back i mean this is a variation on the warriors of like the kind of the uh, have to get home uh, journey that, that they do and then the ultimate climax in, in the warriors and coney island and here in the middle of the street with uh, sledgehammers so that uh, it it's it follows a very su- similar pattern for not surprisingly from the, the very same director however that being said the visual style of it is amazing i don't think it's dated and i think that's intentional as you know as shane says he has kind of a problem with you know when is this film supposed to take place based off the the uh you know the age and style of the clothes and the vehicles but then the music has a modern uh, sound to it um you know it, is it supposed to take place in the 80s is it supposed to take place in the 50s and i think that makes it why it it, it stands the test of time is because it doesn't pigeonhole it into a certain t- atypical era that it's just an adventure it's a rock and roll fantasy if you will as you guys have been quoting throughout the entire podcast so uh, <laughs> um, that it, it can be uh, it is essentially timeless and I think that's one of the things that ultimately does work about it uh, so it is it, it is something to see and if and nothing else if you've seen or you've heard the mu- uh, the song I can dream about you. This is where it came from. And there's some, uh, that, that's the song I'm most familiar with. Um, that's the song I liked the best back then. And that's, that stuck with me, but there are some really good songs on the soundtrack, uh, that you, you know, are just as good, if not possibly even better, uh, that, uh, are worth listening to that you didn't, didn't get a lot of airplay back in the eighties. So I do think it absolutely stands the the test of time and it's worth. And you get to see Diane Lane sing them. Yeah. Uh, you get to see her lip sync them. <laughs> lip sync. So, yeah, but go she's too a far. good lip syncer. Oh yeah, and, uh, she's really good, and it yeah, works. She, and she's really, really good in making sure that microphones. Work. Yeah, she's really good at making sure that microphones directly in front of her lips, so you cannot <laughs> see. <the fact>. So, <laughs> that's you know very what, true. As, as an adult, I do appreciate Amy Madigan more than I ever did. Like, yeah. I don't think I took as much notice of her as, uh, you know, as a kid watching this on VHS or whatever. So I do appreciate her her role more. Well, and, and the last thing I'll say, too, about Amy Madigan was her character actually was written originally as a uh, large Hispanic man. 
when when they cast the, when they wrote the story, it was literally for a, a man, uh, a minority man, to play this. His name was Martinez. That was supposed to be the character, and she came in, read for another role, and she was like, "I want McCoy, or I, you know, I want the Martinez role for me." And they rethought it, and they went, "Yeah, let's let's just do that." So it became she owned that role as a woman. So it was. I thought she owned it. It was great. Is that why they made it her lesbian? Like, well, she's like not lesbian. She's she's kind of she's asexual more so yeah. in in the movie. But um, I, you know, she's very butch. I mean, she's a man basically. She's a soldier, and that's what she keeps saying. I'm a soldier. Um, you know, let me show you what I'm doing. And and she goes out and she does it. She acts like a man through the whole movie. And I thought she pulled it off. But she keeps this. saying Tom Cody's not her type. Like literally, yeah. That's why I said in the opening multiple was multiple yeah. times. Yeah. yeah, but this is 1950s, 1980s, so you know she could be anything. You never know. All right, that does it for this week's review of Streets of Fire. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including the Golden Age of the Silver Screen, the number two review, Movie House Concessions, Movie House Memories, and uh, Chris's new podcast, uh, Noirsville. Again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Lunchtime Move Review. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. I'm Chris. And I'm Shane. Right. And we got to get out of here right now, and you guys are invited. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only the theme music for lunchtime movie review fireworks is provided courtesy of alexander nakaranda at serpentsoundstudios.com under a creative commons attribution 4.0 license all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the mhn podcast network lunchtime movie review and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise noted